Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll be speaking on the topic of is our definition of happiness depriving us of happiness? And I'll speak on Bhagavad Gita 2.66, second chapter 66th verse. It states, Nasti buddhir ayuktasya, nacha ayuktasya bhavana, nacha bhavayataha shantir, ashantasya kutaha sukham. So, na asti buddhir ayuktasya. So, Krishna says in this verse that if we are not properly connected, if we are not properly situated, we cannot have a steady intelligence. Nacha ayuktasya bhavana, nor can we experience proper emotions. Nacha bhavyataha shantir. If our emotional state is not steady, we can't have peace. And then it concludes with a rhetorical question. Ashantasya kutaha sukham. That if there is no peace, how can there be happiness? So, peace, uh, at least a basic peaceful, found, uh, peaceful disposition is foundational for experiencing anything else. So right now you are sitting and you are hearing this talk. Suppose the floor were filled with ants and the ants are biting and the ants are creeping on the body. Now it will be impossible to focus on anything else. So there is something which is foundational, which is essential and after that everything else can be built on it. If somebody is sorting their table or cleaning their room, putting everything, tidying everything, but if below there is an earthquake, <laughs> what, can it, what can the tidying of the room do if there is an earthquake below? So the state of the mind is foundational for experiencing happiness. So we all have certain definitions of what will make us happy. Now, if I get this, if this happens in my life, if this works out right, this is what will make me happy. And these definitions of happiness which we have, they drive our entire life. And often these definitions, they drive us in directions which take us away from happiness. So the, the definitions of happiness that we may have can fall into three broad categories. The Bhagavad Gita analyzes all of existence and especially our own consciousness, our own way of thinking and living in terms of three categories. They are called in Sanskrit as gunas. So these are modes of being, the way we live, the way we think, the way we perceive. And the Bhagavad Gita uses three words, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Sattva is associated with contemplation, observation, analysis. Rajas is associated with action, movement, doing. And Tamas is associated with delusion, with intoxication. So I will put this in three short words and that will be the three broad definitions. So we can have being, doing and having. Being is associated with Sattva. Doing is associated with Rajas. And having is associated with Tamas. So our definition of happiness can come from our being, our doing or our having. I once saw an ad where it said, it was advertisement for a car and it said, you are your car. <laughs> so you are your car. So when I read that, I thought in Sanskrit, the word for ego is ahankar. If you change it slightly, you can make ahamkar. <laughs> ahamkar, I am my car. <laughs> so now certainly at one level we could say, 
Yes, the kind of car a person drives that can make a statement about who they are, what their financial level is, what economic bracket they belong to. Yes, but a person's life and a person's state of well-being and happiness that is not determined just by the kind of car that they drive. So when we equate our sense of self-worth and self-identity with our positions, then that is the state of tamas. So ha now this being, having and being, doing and having, these are present in everyone. And even a person who is driven by position, that I want to possess a car, I want to possess a house, I want to possess this. And even that person is also doing something. And that person is also someone, they are being. There is a, so being, doing and having is present in everyone. But where do we conceive our happiness as coming from? If we conceive that our happiness is coming from having, then that idea is an idea in tamas, in, uh, in uh, a state of this a state that is very distanced from ourselves. Sattva is being, it is close to ourselves, it is who we are. Rajas is doing, it is a little further away from us because we are acting in the world. Tamas is further away from who we are because it is possessing. Now if we consider from another perspective, how much control we have over things, who we are, we have the maximum control over that. What we can do, that we have some control. What we have, on that we have the least control. So suppose somebody is a doctor. Now that is who they are. Now depending on their health, depending on, if sometimes the doctor is not healthy also, then they may not be able to do medical work. They are still a doctor, but being able to do is not always in our control. But a doctor, how, how big their clinic is, how big their home is, how much possessions they have, that is dependent even more on factors beyond their control. So, having, doing and being, these are three broad categories, we could say, which are associated with our existence. And when our happiness comes primarily from having, then that subjects us to a lot of unnecessary anxiety and misery. Now, having things is important. When we are functioning in the world, we need, we need a home, we need food, we need clothes, we need various facilities for functioning in the world. But <coughs> what we live with is different from what we live for. What we live with is the tool for living. The car that we have, that is a tool. That's what we live with. What we live for is the purpose of our life. If the doing and the being aspect are neglected, then a person may have a huge house. But that huge house will only provide the privilege of a larger space in which to feel lonely and unhappy. It won't lead to happiness. It is not that having a larger home can't make you happy. But that it is a facility. And how we use that facility is based not just on having but on doing and even more on being. So when I was about 20-25 years ago, when I was a student in India, I was studying my engineering. At that time, I was driven by the idea that I will become happy if I can possess the tag that I am a topper. So now I was always among the top students in my class. But I was never the topper. 
I was sometimes second, third, fourth, sometimes I was joint first, but I was never the first. And that was the dream that I was driving me throughout my student life. And I started, I started studying engineering in one of the top colleges in India. And while I was studying there, that is the time in my third year, I gave GRE for coming to America. And since my childhood, I liked English language. One of my hobbies was just picking up a dictionary and memorizing words. So generally, Indians do quite well in, in mathematical ability and analytical ability. At that time, GRE had three parts, 800 marks each. So most Indians find the linguistic part a little more difficult. So when I gave my GRE, because my language was quite good, at that time out of 2400, I got 2350. And I was first, not just in my college, but I was first in the history of my college. I was first not just in my college, not just in my university, but in the whole state of Maharashtra. So at that time I was jubilant, so happy. In sports matches, when somebody wins a match, they yahoo! So all that kind of thing, I celebrated. And after just a few hours, I realized that just looking at the mark sheet doesn't really make me happy. It is only when some friend, some relative, some people come and congratulate me. That is when I feel happy. And the way it worked out at that time was three of my friends, one after another, forgot to congratulate me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it had become such a big news that it had, they had put it on the college notice board, the main notice board in the canteen which we had. There they had put it. So almost the whole college knew that I had got the marks. So this friend, they thought everybody knows. They also know why congratulate. <laughs> so somehow, so when, when the first person did congratulate, first friend, I was a little annoyed. And the second person was, didn't congratulate, I felt agitated. And when the third person didn't congratulate, I was angered. So the, emo, the, the emotion was going further, from annoyance to agitation to anger. And then, somehow, by, by God's grace, that when I go through some difficult situations, sometimes I get a conceptual out-of-body experience. Out-of-body experiences are special experiences that some people have when they are near death and sometimes they see themselves from outside the body. So a conceptual out-of-the-body experience means, let's say I am sitting here right now, but I look at myself from above. We as human beings have this capacity to look at ourselves. So at that time, as I was just about to speak something to my friend, it is a little embarrassing. It's when you want to be congratulated, but you can't, you, you can't actually ask, why are you not congratulating me? <laughs> so I was just angry. I didn't know what to say. And at that time, suddenly I felt as if I was looking at myself from above. And it struck me. Hey, wait a minute. Through, for so many years in my life, I was dreaming that if I just become a topper, I'll become happy. But I have become a topper now and I'm not feeling happy. Rather, I'm feeling more agitated. Instead of being happy, now I have become more dependent for my happiness on others. Earlier, I could just interact with people and to go on with the business of life. But now I have become so dependent on others for my happiness. So, is this really happiness? So, that experience shook me to the core. And it made me re-examine the purpose that I wanted to achieve in my life. And fortunately, by Krishna's mercy, while I was in that introspective stage, that was the time a friend who had just started studying the Bhagavad Gita, he came and told me about the Bhagavad Gita. And I started reading it. So for all of us, we, we are most of the times in our life driven by certain definitions of happiness. 
and just like a horse when it is driven often there are almost blinders put on the horse so that the horse can't look here there because the horse starts looking here and there the horse will get distracted and we just march off so our definition of happiness puts blinders on us so that we can't think of anything else this is what i want to achieve in my life this is if i get this only then i'll be happy but sometimes while we are moving through life with these blinders on us sometimes those blinders come off sometimes we get such as some experiences which make us question what am i actually doing is this what i want to do in my life is this what i want to do with with my life and if at those times when the blinders have temporarily opened if at that time a ray of spiritual knowledge comes in then our whole life's trajectory can change in a more auspicious direction so that time when this friend gave me the bhagavad gita i started reading it and then i came in the sixth chapter to a verse 6.22 which says that yam labdhva cha param labham manyate nadikam tatah yasmin sthito na dukhena guruna api vichalyate so krishna says that when we have attained that state of spiritual trance of samadhi of absorption in the supreme spiritual reality in krishna when we have attained that state two things happen yam labdhva having attained it cha aparam labham manyate na adhikam tatah having attained this we feel that there is nothing more to be gained and yasmin sthito once we are situated like this na dukhena guruna api vichalyate even if great distress comes in our life we will not be disturbed so krishna tells over here what i felt at that time this was the real definition of success in life achieving something after achieving that there is no more craving i have to get this i have to get this i have to get this there is no more craving and secondly having attained that we get an inner fortitude inner strength by which we can withstand this stress the bhagavad gita does not make a utopian promise saying that there will be no more distress in your life achieve something and there will be no more distress in your life no that is never going to happen that is going to be distress but we can develop an inner shield an inner strength by which we can tolerate that distress so this again was another epiphany another illuminating moment for me so this idea of having certain things whether they actually make us happy this is a question which we need to ask ourselves and maybe after the session when you go back home you can explore in your own life there might there would all be something which we thought once i have this it will make me happy so having is what we is one definition of happiness now within having there can be many things is it it might be oh i want to have a big house a big car a, a great phone i want to have this i want to have that we all uh, we all have certain ideas which are culturally created if we were living a few hundred years ago people nobody knew about cars cars didn't exist so today in today's world people think i just need to get a car if i get a fancy car then i saw another advertisement once it said that uh, it was a young man driving a car and there was a attractive young girl looking at adoringly at him and in the background there was another young man glaring at him and the advertisement was buy this car and enjoy the envy in your neighbor's eyes 
now this is such a sad level of enjoyment it is not even not even enjoy the car it is enjoy the envy in someone's eyes how see it is such a is a unsteady level of enjoyment because tomorrow if your neighbor gets a better car than you then the car there's no enjoyment in the car at all in fact that the no neighbor will enjoy the envy in your eyes <laughs> so our culture cultural <laughs> situation our culture our media they all propagate certain def- conceptions of happiness and we uncritically accept them <coughs> when now whenever we see some advertisements we often know that okay all that is promised is not really going to be there but still there are if we have something like a, a skeptical filter within us but this skeptical filter blocks certain things but it allows certain things to come inside so somebody may show that oh if you drink this this particular wine it is so enjoyable now we have a skeptical filter it says now oh, this wine is not going to make me happy forget it so i don't want to drink so we will we are skeptical about certain certain promises of the world the certain promises that the world makes about what will make us happy but we are gullible about certain promises and we need to evaluate to convince ourselves that do i have any experience of how having does not lead to happiness now it is not that having is bad having may be essential but the idea that having will bring happiness that idea is deleterious it is harmful it mis it is misleading <coughs> so now beyond this we could have the idea of doing so associating with these three words because having doing and being i'll talk about the positives as i said having is not bad but what we have how what is our attitude towards it so here we need to associate having with contentment no matter how much we have there will always be people in the world who have more than us and if we don't learn contentment if we don't learn to be satisfied we will always stay unhappy if our if we don't learn this look at learn to look at what we have instead of looking at what we don't have if we don't learn this no matter what else we do in our life we will never become happy the bhagavad gita talks about tapasya austerity in the 17th chapter and there it states austerity of the body austerity of the mind and austerity of speech so in austerity of the mind it states that <clears throat> we all need to cultivate satisfaction mana prasada saumyatvam maunam atma vinigraha bhava samshuddhiritti etat tapo manasam uchyate that we need to cultivate or satisfaction as a austerity of the mind now normally austerity tapasya means that we f- we feel naturally inclined to do something but we decide i will not do it so yes yesterday was ekadashi so many of us were fasting from particular foods so we may feel like eating those foods but although we feel like it we don't do it so that's physical austerity so fasting is a physical austerity so when satisfaction what does it mean when it is a mental austerity we often think of satisfaction as a emotion oh i'm feeling satisfied i'm not feeling satisfied yes satisfaction is a emotion but satisfaction is not just an emotion satisfaction is also a decision 
Decision means in every situation in life, there are some things which we have and some things which we don't have. And if we choose to look at the things that we have, we will feel satisfied. If we choose to look at the things that we don't have, we will feel dissatisfied. So when we say satisfaction is a decision, that is a decision to look at what we have instead of looking at what we don't have. Uh, suppose after this program there is Prasad. There is no suppose, Prasad is there. <laughs> but suppose, <laughs> but suppose there is a, suppose there were a program after which there will be a special feast. And the feast is that everybody has special items in their feet. So, we are having delicious items in our plate, but what is in my plate is different from what is in your plate and what is different from your plate. <laughs> now, I can eat the feast on my plate and savor it. But, if I keep looking, oh, what is in his plate? What is in his plate? <laughs> what is in her plate? As I keep looking at that, although I have delicious food with me, I will not be able to enjoy it. So, similarly in our life, we all have a plate and there are good things in our plate also. But if we keep looking at what is there in others plate, we can never be satisfied. So with respect to having, the healthy attitude is contentment, which comes by focusing on what we have instead of what we don't have. Now with Rajas, the active, the, what is associated is doing. So when we are in, in Rajoguna, at that time, the first thing is, what am I doing? And then, okay, from that it may go towards, what I, who am I? Or what am I possessing? <coughs> so this is somewhat better. So some people are super active. Just do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. It tells them to sit peacefully. As soon as they sit peacefully, their mind stops being peaceful. Their mind is wild and mind makes them go wild and if this becomes steady, they try to become peaceful externally, their mind's energy becomes even more. Mind goes even more wild. So in such a situation, how we see what we do is important. Generally in today's world, if we tell anyone be contented, be satisfied, the whole consumer economy in the world runs on consumer dissatisfaction. <laughs> now, if customers are satisfied with the phones that they have, nobody will buy the new version of the phone. And the most consumer products, uh, they, they run because they are able to make customers dissatisfied with whatever products, they have, whatever, whatever products are there already. So now, with respect to, so generally the idea is, it's not just with respect to con, con, the consumer economy, but the whole idea in the professional world today is that should never be satisfied. People think that satisfaction is the poison for ambition. And ambition is what will help you to grow in life. Now, it's not necessarily like that. We can, ha we can have satisfaction, we can be satisfied with what we have and still we can be ambitious. Ambition does not require dissatisfaction. In fact, if dissatisfaction is the fuel for ambition, <coughs> then no matter how much we succeed in our ambition, still dissatisfaction will stay with us. Why? Because if we achieve, associate ambition with having more and more and more, so we think that, okay, if I have more, I have more, I have more, then I'll become happy. But our unhappiness is not coming from what we don't have. Our unhappiness is coming from our attitude of looking at what we don't have. And no matter how much we have, there will always be things that we don't have. Oh, somebody thinks, oh, I want wealth and wealth will make me happy. 
than I want to be the wealthiest person in my my family in my generation. My brothers, my cousins, I want to be the wealthiest. Okay, become wealthy. Then I want to be the wealthiest person in the history of my family. I want to be the wealthiest person in my community. I want to be the wealthiest person in my district. I want to be the wealthiest person in my country. I want to be the wealthiest person in the world. I want to be the wealthiest person in the history of the world. And as we keep pursuing this, we become history. <laughs> <laughs> this is just an endless journey. It is. So, <clears throat> if we think that ambition will be driven by dissatisfaction, then no matter how successful we are in our ambition, we will always have dissatisfaction. So, satisfaction comes by looking at what we have. That doesn't mean that we don't seek what we don't have. But we focus on what we have. And so doing is also, so people think that if I am dissatisfied, then I will do more. But that is not the only motive for action. Action can be motivated by dissatisfaction. Or action can be motivated by contribution. So, when we act, we can act so that I will get this. Or I will act so that I will do this, so that I can contribute this. So, somebody, contribute this means, say, if somebody is an artist, somebody is an author, somebody is a software engineer, somebody is a teacher, whatever particular profession we may be in. Now, in every profession, there is something that is our contribution. And there is something that is our remuneration, what we give and what we get. So if what we are doing is motivated primarily by what we are getting, then that doing will keep us dissatisfied and distressed. And we will become very unsteady. Oh, maybe if I do this, I'll get more. Maybe if I do that, I'll get more. If I do that, I'll get more. But if what we are doing is motivated by a spirit of contribution. Okay, how can I make a solid contribution over here? How can I increase my contribution? The universe ultimately is a reciprocal. Now, if we give, we will get. We may not always get in exactly the same way that we expect or desire. We may get in a different way. But if we focus on contributing, then there is a greater sense of control for us. If somebody is a teacher and that person thinks that you know, I want to be the highest paid teacher. Well, that depends on so many other factors which may or may not be in our control. Most of the time they are not in our control. But somebody decides, now, I want to teach the best that I can. Let me bring the maximum value in the contribute maximum value to the contribution that I am doing. Then that helps us to focus again on what is in our control. So if I think my doing is, is simply a tool to having, then if I don't have, then there's no happiness. But if my doing is a tool to being. Let me do, let me act in such a way that I can be the best teacher I can be. If I am a parent, instead of thinking that my children should become like this, that is not in our control. But what is in our control is, let me be, become the, let me act in such a way so that I can become the best parent that I can be. So if our doing is motivated by contribution, then that brings a further steadiness in our life. We'll still do our best. And in fact, we actually will be able to do our best in a much more uh, focused way. Because if we are doing for having, then we are always worried. Will I have this or not have this? Then if I'm not having it, what is the point in doing this? So we'll be distracted, half-hearted and agitated if we are doing simply for having. But if we are doing for being, 
to be who we are meant to be then that is a much more healthier approach to action so in rajas at, uh, in this mode we are concerned primarily with action and we think action as a tool to position but action can be a tool to realization to become who i am meant to be then going further there is sattva the word sat means existence wo means to be so to be who we are meant to be that is sattva so in sattva the focus is on being now the bhagavad gita gives this whole analysis a spiritual foundation it explains that we are all at our core souls the soul is a non material particle of consciousness and this every soul is a part of the supreme soul of krishna so being means understanding that i am a soul who is a part of krishna and as a soul i have a particular body mind and i have a particular set of positions in this world so the soul is here around the soul is the body mind with which soul can do certain things and then by doing certain things the soul can get certain things so being refers to the soul doing refers to the body which the soul has and having refers to what one can get using that body so if we consider the soul is who we are that is what is in the most our control to be who we are meant to be to do certain things yes we we can do but sometimes we are able to do sometimes we are not able to do say right uh, uh, say i am a speaker right now i am speaking so tomorrow if i get a sore throat i'll not be able to speak but still if i understand that i am a soul and i am a part of krishna and i'm speaking as a service to krishna then i can still be situated in my identity that i am still a servant of krishna even if i can't do the particular activity of speaking right if i think of possessing and i think that i should speak in such a way that hundreds of people come for my talks then now how many people will come for a any program that is not in my control sometimes many people will come sometimes not many people will come sometimes many people will come generally i found that how people's interest is very it's very difficult to understand what will make people more interested sometimes there's a large crowd that is going to hundreds of people or thousands of people are there and the talk is going on sometimes everybody feels that the talk is for everyone else <laughs> <laughs> because there are so many people in the audience <laughs> so everybody feels that talk is for all these other people <laughs> but when there is a small group then everybody connects more okay this is the speaker is speaking to me i am here i am thinking so sometimes just the sheer quantity may not in any way relate to the quality the quantity of the audience may not relate to the quality of the attention but if the conception is the success of speaking is based on having having a large audience then that is not in the speaker's control at all so in everything that we do in our life the doing being being doing and having are integral aspects but what is the foundation so i started by talking about ashanta se kutah sukham so we talked about how if there the earth is quaking tidying a room makes no sense so for people who focus on having i have to have this i have to have that i have to have that but they have not worked on their doing or on their being then even if they have something it is not of much use it is most people dream of having a lot of wealth oh as in australia i uh, met a devotee who is a in- inheritance attorney you now when inheritance is passed on so he said now the government is seriously considering making laws and many parents 
when they pass on their inheritance to their children they have strict strictures of how much inheritance the the children can spend per year the parents may give a huge house to the children now that the children say if they are teenagers or they are young they may get into some habit they may be drinking they may be having drugs or they may be just squandering money and gambling or whatever there are so many ways in which money can be just squandered so there are many cases where the parents were phenomenally wealthy and the children within three to within just a couple few years just squander all the wealth and the children end up on the streets with nothing they were living in mansions they were owners of mansions and they are homeless so what happened over there this having was there but they the having was without proper doing and without proper being they were not doing anything they were not making any contribution they just inherited everything and they just squandered it all away so if we focus on the foundation the foundation for having is doing if you focus on oh i want to have this i want to have that i want to have that okay people will tell us okay you do your job well if you keep doing your job well you will grow and you can possess things what you want the foundation of having is doing but the foundation of doing is being if we are situated in inner security in proper understanding of who we are then that will give us stability so i associated having with contentment I associate doing with contribution we do so that we can make a contribution and being is associated with <coughs> connection to be we are not just isolated beings we are souls who are parts of krishna and to be uh, so the sattva has two aspects to sattva and shuddha sattva in sattva we live in harmony with ourselves we understand okay these are my strengths these are my limitations let me work with whatever i have whatever resources i have let me work with who i am in, so in sattva we come to harmony with ourselves in shuddha sattva we come to harmony with krishna that me in shuddha sattva means purified state of existence in that purified state focus on okay whatever i have my connection with krishna is most important we have many connections in the world we have connections with people in the world those are horizontal connections and we have a vertical connection with krishna so this vertical connection with krishna is our only eternal connection all other connections they are important while they are there but they are not everlasting so oh, this vertical connection can bring a supreme stability in our life what we have may change what we do may change who we are that will never change no matter how many things go wrong externally or even internally in terms of our body's health or our mind's emotions but still we remain souls who are parts of krishna and the process of bhakti yoga is meant to connect us with krishna and when we connect ourselves with krishna we understand that krishna has a place and purpose for us in the world all of us are meant to make a contribution in the world all of us are meant to attain a destination it is eternal beyond this world so oh, the isha upanishad which is the one of the most prominent upanishads it says that om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate it says the absolute truth is complete and perfect 
and whatever emanates from that absolute truth is also complete and perfect that means that we are souls who are parts of krishna so krishna is perfect we are perfect and the world is also perfect the world is also an emanation from krishna that means that there is for each one of us a place and purpose in the world that we don't have to search oh i have to grab this i have to possess this i have to become like this no if we just be who we are if we just realize who we are and become who we are meant to be we will find our place and purpose and we will have stability during our life journey and we will have a eternal destination for our life journey beyond this life so this being is what the process of bhakti yoga focuses on bhakti yoga is not about rejecting having or doing but it is of prioritizing properly <coughs> so when we do our sadhana when we do our chanting of the holy names when we do our swadhyaya we to study scriptures when we come for satsang like this when we do our puja all this is not just a religious ritual it is actually meant to help us realize it meant who we are it is meant to remind us who we are so at our core we are indestructible no matter how many things go wrong in the world but still we remain indestructible we remain secure krishna is with us and in our relationship with him there is security and with that inner security when we realize it then we act then we have then both our actions and our possessions will be used in a way that will increase our happiness so our definition of happiness it doesn't always have to deprive us of happiness if the definition is correct then the definition can give us direction the right direction for the pursuit for our pursuit of happiness and ultimately by living in harmony with ourselves and living in harmony with krishna you know we find our place and purpose in life and we make our by our connection with krishna we get the inner calm the inner clarity by which we can understand what is my contribution to me how can i contribute best in my relationships in my profession in my various activities that i am doing how can i best contribute and how can i be content with what i have how can i find cultivate satisfaction all that will come to us when we become situated in who we are in our understanding of who we are in realizing who we are if we are in a new place i'll conclude with this example that if we are in new if we are going to someone's house and we are staying in a new place it's a big place and uh, we are not able to find any light anywhere now even if we go into one room we look around and our phone is discharged we somehow find one light but that light only illumines that room and sometimes some rooms have little faint lights at night and when you go to the next room you have to find another light we go to the next room so it's a big place next room we have to go each room we have to go we have to find one one light but suppose we know where the master switch is at one switch we turn on the whole house becomes lit wherever we go there is light so practicing bhakti yoga and connecting with krishna is like turning on that master switch seeking happiness through having or doing is like turning on small small lights that will give us some happiness but it will be very short lived it will be there for some time it will be gone when i got that gra score i was happy but it was very short lived happiness so krishna consciousness is the one switch that lights everything in our life krishna says in the bhagavad gita mat chitta sarva durgaani mat prasada drishyasi If you become conscious of me, 
you will pass over all obstacles by my grace this is the light that can guide us throughout our life whatever situations whatever difficulties whatever obstacles whatever adversities come in our life with krishna by our side we can march through everything so when 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 whenever we are feeling unhappy then that is often because we have associate our happiness with having something and we don't have it that's why we are not feeling happy but that having it may be desirable but it is not essential for our happiness <coughs> so if we recognize okay this is my definition of happiness is this really valid do i really need to let that definition of happiness define me control me if we situate ourselves in a relationship with krishna we will understand that krishna has a place and a purpose for us whatever difficulties we are going through they will be there for some time the difficulty is the uncertainty in our having or our doing if we see that simply as a deprivation oh so many problems in my life but if we see it as a opportunity for realizing okay who am i really what am i meant to do so if we see the instability in our having and our doing as a um, impetus for focusing on our being then that instability will actually give us greater security greater wisdom in our life and in general in sports if uh, there are winners and there are losers the winners are happier but the losers are wiser the winners are happier but they so caught in the happiness yes we won but the losers learn more okay this this i could have done better this i could have done better the losers are wiser so so sometimes in our life we will be winners sometimes we will be losers so when we find that we are losing something in our having or our doing we can see that as an opportunity to become wiser that what is it who am i really meant to be so when we are down to nothing when things seem to be going wrong in our life our positions are uncertain our positions are uncertain our profession is uncertain uh, so many uncertainties are there when we are down to nothing then krishna is up to something <laughs> <laughs> when we are when we are down to nothing krishna is up to something he what is he up to we may not know in specifics but he is helping us to realize who we are meant to be to focus on our being and by focusing on our being we can find happiness with whatever we have and with whatever we are doing and we can make a positive change in both if we have the security in our being so i'll summarize i spoke today on the topic of uh, are our definitions of happiness depriving us of happiness is there a lot of concepts so i'll try to repeat here uh, i talked about how our definition of happiness can be associated with our having our doing or our being having is associated with the tamoguna the mode the modes are subtle forces that shape things in the world and they shape our conceptions so one definition of happiness is with associated with having and talk elaborately about the problem with this that krishna says in the bhagavad gita ashantasya kutah sukham that if we are not peaceful how can there be happiness whatever else we do if insects or ants are biting us even if we are doing something enjoyable we can't enjoy it if we are tidying a house but if there is a the floor is quaking tidying is useless so what is foundational has to come first what is subsequent has to come later so in having be doing and being foundational is being but when we are in, uh, in tamas when that that time having becomes foundational doing becomes secondary and being becomes tertiary and the problem with that is what we have is never in our is uh, frequently not in our control and even if we get what we have there'll always be others who have more 
having what we having it may also not lead to happiness like i got the experience when i had that tag that i am the topper but it only made me dependent on my happiness dependent for my happiness on others so happiness so in with respect to having we need to cultivate i talk about three c's with each of these having doing and being with having was yeah contentment contention is uh, yeah contention is yeah contentment is being satisfied so i talked about how satisfaction is the austerity of the mind satisfaction is not just an emotion that we feel but it's a decision that we make and the decision means instead of looking at what i don't have which is what the world is going to show us i talked about how advertisements create dissatisfaction within us so instead of looking at what we don't have we focus on looking at what we have instead of looking at what is there in other people's plates we focus on savoring what is in our plate and then will this lead to lethargy and lack of ambition not necessarily ambition <coughs> can be fueled by dissatisfaction but if that is the case then no matter how much we achieve we'll keep looking at what we don't have and we will sentence ourselves to perpetual dissatisfaction even if somebody by ambition i accuse gets a big house but that will only provide him the privilege of being lonely and unhappy in a huge space so we can act we can have ambition that is motivated not by possession but by contribution that also doing we associate with contribution so if if we are contributing in whatever role we are in our profession in our relationships even immediately there may not be a return for it but eventually there will be a return if somebody wants to be the best most paid teacher that may be difficult but if somebody wants to be the best teacher they can be that is much more in their control in general when we focus the more on the more on the things that are in our control the more we can make a positive change and then lastly i talked about being being means that we are souls who have a particular body mind and we by krishna's arrangement we have a place and purpose in us we don't have to have to have something or do something to acquire do have something have something out of the way or do something out of the way if you just focus on understanding who we are and contributing accordingly we will find our place and purpose and thereby we will find contentment so when we face difficulties in life instead of becoming disheartened it says winners may be happier but losers are wiser if the losers focus on learning so if we focus on if there's in if there's insecurity uncertainty in our having or our doing then if we see that as a impetus of focusing on our being that that vertical connection with krishna he is eternal we are eternal he is indestructible we are indestructible and our connection with him can also be eternal and indestructible that can give us the stablest foundation by which we can bring positivity into our doing and into our having so we don't have to give up doing or having but we have to have the right priority where we focus first on being then on doing and then finally on having and if in our having or doing we are seem to be losing things then we can gain solace by contemplating that when we are down to nothing krishna is up to something thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments yes sir it's a nice class i don't know where to start but uh, one thing which is still not resonating well with me is uh, the ambition in contribution so how do i really relate it in my life in my uh, so suppose we are having a bhakti uksha which is i can relate to uh, contribution so does it mean that now i should be ambitious uh, to have 
20 people instead of 10 people or 30 people. Is that kind of ambition we are talking or how, how do we put in right perspective ambition for contribution? Okay. What exactly does ambition for contribution mean? I mean, say if we are doing a Bhakti Viksha program, a spiritual program, then is it that we want more and more people to come? That is the that is the ambition? Not exactly. So, Shila Prabhupada is our paradigmatic example, is our exa ideal, an ideal example of how to practice Bhakti in today's world. So, Prabhupada had great ambition. He, even when he had nothing, he just came with 40 rupees from India. But he had, a, he had dreams of having big, big temples across the world. So certainly, Prabhupada had ambition. But it was not that Prabhupada was dissatisfied. Even when Prabhupada was unknown Swami walking on the streets of New York, what attracted people to him was his sense of contentment. He was so happy. He was so happy glorifying Krishna. He was speaking about Krishna, writing about Krishna, worshipping Krishna, offering bhoga to Krishna. He was happy in that. He wanted to do more also. So there can be the sense that uh, ambition for contribution means that I want to do more for Krishna. But in whatever we are doing, there are some things in our control, there are some things not in our control. So we focus on the things that are in our control. So, if we are doing a program, we can focus on making sure that we have the best content that we present in the class, the best that is possible for us. We have a good culture in the community that we are building, so that people who come there feel, feel welcomed, feel warm, feel wanted over there. And if we have certain attempts means for publicizing, we publicize also. So, in any situ situation, if we f when we focus on contribution means that we focus on what is in our control and try to maximize that. And there are th things which are beyond our control and that we leave it to Krishna. So, surrender is in both ways. Surrender means at one level to leave to Krishna the things that are not in our control. But surrender also means doing wholeheartedly the things that are in our control. So, we surrender can have these two expressions. There is a diligence for Krishna and there is dependence on Krishna. So, diligence for Krishna means we do to the best of our capacity. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna doesn't surrender to Krishna by raising his hands in dependence. He picks up his bow in readiness to fight. So, as a warrior, fighting expertly was in his control. And he was diligent in doing that. So diligence for Krishna is how Arjuna surrenders to Krishna. But even when Arjuna was surrendering like that, there were times when things were beyond his control. When he had taken a vow that he will avenge the death, of, he will avenge the death of Abhimanyu by felling Jayadrath by the by on by evening of the fourteenth. He fought diligently, but the Kaurava troops at the last moment just crowded in. So many warriors and soldiers came that he was completely blocked, so close yet so far. So at that time, there's dependence on Krishna. And Krishna miraculously intervened, covered the sun. And then he was able to shoot Jayadrat. So for us, the, when we talk about contribution, we, are, we focus on the diligence for Krishna in the things that are in our control. And we cultivate the dependence on Krishna by doing our sadhana bhakti. We do our swadhyaya, our japa, our japa, all this is meant to help us cultivate the dependence on Krishna. That mood that what is not in my control is not out of control. It is in Krishna's control. And Krishna will make things work out for the good. Does that answer your question? Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes? Um, I have a question that, um, what if you, in your life, like what if I want something and, so it would, would it, is it correct if you, 
if you want something and you're doing for it, is it like, is it still having or is it still called having or doing? Uh, if you want something and we're doing um, something to get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you want something and we are doing something to get it, so is that having centered or doing centered? Is okay. <laughs> okay, centered is a different. Okay, I understood you. So is it having or doing? Okay, so basically, when we we are living beings, we are conscious beings, to have desires is natural. So when we see different people have, oh, I had this, this person had this toy, this person had this phone, this person has this dress, we naturally have desires. And then we may do certain things, say if, if there is a drama, if there is a drama competition in your school or a writing competition and you want to get the first prize. And then you're doing something for it. You're learning to act nicely. You're learning to write nicely. So, uh, if somebody just desires to get that thing without doing anything, somebody thinks, oh, I want to win the first prize in the fancy dress competition. <coughs> but they're not even getting a good costume. Then, there's no point in that. So, just wanting something, I want to have this, but you're not doing anything. That is not good. That will lead to only frustration, it is daydreaming. But, even, but sometimes we may do the best that we can. We may, we may dress us, do, may get a good costume, do everything nicely. But still sometimes we may not get it. So, we may be doing for having. But even if we don't get it, we should know that actually, you know, as you are, as you are, Krishna is in your heart and Krishna loves you. And Krishna has a plan for you. So even if this one thing doesn't work out, that doesn't mean it is terribly wrong. Sometimes some things work out, some things don't work out. So if you want to have something and we are doing something for it, that is good. But even more fundamentally, if you see this in a mood of service to Krishna, Krishna, I want to do this so that I can do this in a mood of service to you. I want to become a nice singer. You have given me some ability, so I want to sing nicely. I want to do act nicely. Maybe in future, if I learn to sing nicely, then I can sing some songs of Krishna. I can do some dramas for Krishna if I can learn to act nicely. So if you think that if I'm a student, I want to be a good student because I want to do it in a mood of service to Krishna. So if I have that understanding, that even if that doing does not lead to having, I do it, but still I don't get it. But what will happen is, if we do it in the mood of service to Krishna, we will go closer to Krishna. And we will still have satisfaction, even if we don't get it. And as we move closer to being who we are, then we will be able to do also more positively, and we will be able to have things also more. So, it's, uh, it's doing for having is good. But doing to serve Krishna, to be who we are meant to be. That is the best. And in by Krishna's plan, whatever we are meant to have, we will get it in your course. Okay? Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Yes. Two things stand out in your class. One is like happiness is not a need, it's a decision. Hmm. And then we uh, decide and happiness is not an emotion, it's a decision. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's not an emotion, it's a decision. Yeah. Uh, and having being and doing. Being is the more stable way where we can relate to happiness in a proper way. Yeah. And then you say the other statement was if things are not happening as per plan, then Krishna has a different plan for you. So my question is if it is a decision where should we draw a line? Like, you know, okay, this thing is not a plan of Krishna, no matter how hard I try. Because in okay. our being, doing, having, okay. there will always be a place where we need to set boundaries. Mm. Okay, good question. So, where do we set a boundary? If we say that satisfaction is a decision, we may be endeavoring to say, do something and have something. But then, 
should we just keep doing it even if I don't get it and think that Krishna has a plan and Krishna will give it to me later? Or should I just understand that this is not meant to be and move on to something else? Or just be contented with what I have right now? Yes, there is no, no black and white kind of categorization in this. But broadly, uh, the one defining thing is that nothing except our relationship with Krishna should be the defining thing for us. So, we all have various desires and those desires can have different degrees of intensity. So, for somebody uh, getting a big house, that might be just their, their, their driving desire, they just can't give it up. For somebody else, okay, if I have it, it's good. If I don't have it, it's not such a big deal for them. So we can't have a one-size-fit-all formula that at this point, you have to be satisfied. It's like food. We can't have a universal standard. Everybody should eat this much food. Now, each person's metabolism is different. Each person's uh, need for food will be different. But every one of us can overall make out. Now, this is too little for me. This is becoming, I'm overeating now. So that requires introspection. Now, of course, people who are around us, observing us, they can also tell us yeah, if we have some good association. You know, you are doing too much of it. Don't eat so less. It will not be good for your health. Or, you know, this is too much. This is, people may tell us also if you have good friends. So it's generally introspection and association. So what applies to food also applies to our doing and having. So, if, say, if we are pursuing something and that pursuit is so for something which is a very deep-rooted desire for us, then maybe the best way to deal with the desire is to keep pursuing that, get that and then move ahead in life. Something which is more of a circumstantial desire. Okay, people say, this is good. I also think this is good. But that is not something so deep rooted for me. Even if I don't have it, it doesn't matter. So, the, the example of food I gave for the point that individually we have to make the decision. And what we have to make the individual decision is, which is the boundary for what? So, if in, I want to earn more money, but what all am I ready to do to earn more money? See, growth is natural in life. All of us were just one tiny cell in our mother's womb. Now there are millions of cells in our body. So that one cell has grown. So growth is natural. However, cancer is also growth. <laughs> but cancer is a growth that is disproportional and destructive. So when our normal body grows, the different parts of the body grow proportionately and that helps in the person becoming person growing so if one desire becomes obsessive for us and for that desire we start neglecting everything else in life then that is uh, that is that desire is becoming cancerous and then we have to say that, okay, this may be an important desire for me, but other things are also important. So, in a sense of proportion, I may focus more on this, but I have to have a sense of proportion. So, generally, in companies, I was speaking a few months ago in Google. So, there also this topic came up as ambition and dissatisfaction. So, they are explaining that, generally, when... When does ambition become greed? The word greed, generally we understand we should not be greedy. But we should be ambitious. So when does ambition become greed? So when ambition makes us cross ethical boundaries. When ambition pushes us beyond ethical boundaries, then it becomes greed. Krishna says, Dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamosmi bharatarshara. Kama is desire. It can refer to sexual desire, it can refer to desire in general, it can even refer to ambition. But when ambition makes me give up dharma, ambition makes me flout dharma, 
then uh, when karma makes me give up dharma then it becomes evil it becomes destructive so if while pursuing our uh, pursuing our particular desires if the desire is very important for us even then we make sure that we have a sense of proportion that i don't neglect my morality for that i don't reject my morality i don't reject my spirituality we have a sense of proportion with which we pursue it then that pursuit can move on and <clears throat> we may ourselves if we do introspection we can decide that okay this is important for me so i'll pursue it and then okay i may pursue this i'll pursue this course of action for the next 6 months or one year no matter how many reversals i get and then after that i may decide is this okay maybe this is not come for one year what what does this mean does this mean that this is not meant to me or does it mean that i am meant to pursue further so we can pray again we can introspect when prabhupad was trying to share krishna bhakti almost for 40 years in india he did not get any results so prabhupad kept trying but he did not keep trying the same thing he kept trying different things at different times also so i feel if we have if we do introspection and if we have association uh, if that means we uh, don't just be driven by our emotions but we calmly reflect and get a sense of proportion to introspection and then we have some uh, friend close trusted friends mentors who can guide us they can help us to think more clearly when our mind becomes fuzzy then through introspection and uh, introspection and association we can maintain a sense of proportion while pursuing our ambition Does that answer your question thank you Yeah. Uh, when we are complete, how can that be nullified or negated? Okay. And what yeah. uh, what what do we what drives us? Uh, after being complete, still what drives us? Okay. Yes. So if we are already complete, then how can that be nullified? And if we are already complete, then what will drive us? Yes, there are two kinds of completeness. There is independent completeness and there is dependent completeness. So for what does that mean? For example, my hand. The hand is complete and perfect for its purpose. For holding things, for touching things, for feeling things, for picking things, the hand is perfect. But if I try to use the hand for thinking, I can't do that. So the hand is perfect as a part of the whole. It is complete. Completeness has to be seen in context, not in isolation. Completeness has to be seen in the light of the purpose. So and so that means in purpose means the hand is meant to serve a particular function within the whole to which it belongs. So the hand becomes disconnected from the body. then the hand can't serve any function it may just look like a hand but it can't serve any purpose so a phone is uh, a phone is a very useful device for making phone calls and occasionally we get the phone has also facility for sending messages but if tomorrow i decide that i want to write my new book on a phone and then i'm typing typing and it's so messy and i think this phone is useless why did the person design a phone like this well the phone was not designed for writing a book isn't it we can use it incidentally for writing some things so the the utility of a phone the value of a phone has to be seen in the light of its purpose its primary purpose secondary purpose also it may serve but the the perfection of the design of the phone the completeness of the phone's design has to be seen in the light of its primary purpose so similarly we are parts of krishna and our completeness is in our connection with krishna so the hand is physically connected with the body our connection with krishna is not physical it is through our consciousness so when we become disconnected from krishna we feel dissatisfied so actually speaking we are eternally parts of krishna so we are never in the ultimate sense disconnected from him 
but in our consciousness when we become disconnected from him then we feel dissatisfaction so we because we are dependent complete not independent complete so when the dependence means that the dependence is that we are connected with the whole so when that connection is no longer there then that sense of completeness is no longer felt that's why we feel un incomplete or dissatisfied and what is the motivation for doing something see our, our completeness is not static it is dynamic the hand is is complete for doing the function that the hand is meant to do so similarly we are complete in our relationship with krishna so there is uh, the completeness there is there is action that is done because the state of completeness is a state of dynamic connection so it's not of a uh, it's not a static isolation so so we act so that we stay connected with krishna we be so that we be connected with krishna we have so that we can connect with krishna so all being acting and doing are all meant to help us connect with krishna and that connection is what gives us wholeness so uh, so act, the motivation for action is maintaining that connection and then sharing that connection with others uh, say a person who is <coughs> hungry hmm? may go to a hotel to get some food and if a person is a beggar he must wait outside the hotel maybe somebody after some things they remain up and the hotel closes i'll get some food hmm? now somebody who has cooked a lot of food and they are full themselves uh, they may also go to a hotel and see outside the hotel if there's someone to whom they can distribute the food so both are acting the first is acting out of sense of incompleteness oh i don't have food i want i want to i want food the second is not acting out of sense of incompleteness second is full the second is i have so much food i want to share that food with others so for us when we act in our relationship with krishna it is not with a sense of incompleteness that we want to overcome yes at present because our connection with krishna is not there so we do feel a sense of incompleteness and we act to connect with krishna so that we start feeling more and more complete but in the purified stage we we are we are connected with krishna and we act to share that completeness with others does that answer your question yeah. thank you okay uh, the exact meaning of consciousness is for krishna consciousness Okay. This consciousness is related with mind, or with intellect, or or with spirit, or with combination of all these things. Okay, good question. <laughs> Very. So, uh, what is consciousness exactly? Is it related with the mind, intelligence, or the spirit? Okay. The word consciousness has two distinct meanings, but I'll focus on one meaning first, and then move to the next meaning. So, consciousness refers. <coughs> to the capacity to be aware so we could say that say this is a light bulb and from there light is coming out so consciousness is like the light coming from the soul it the aditya yatha sarvagatam shokshma akasham nopalipati 13.33 and 34 krishna used two examples to explain how consciousness exists So he says one example he uses about the sun. The sun is at one place, but it spreads its light everywhere. So the so consciousness comes from the soul. The soul is the is radiant particle like the bulb, and from which consciousness is coming out. Now the consciousness is the light that comes out, but consciousness is also the seer of what is shown by the light. because the consciousness is not like a bulb alone suppose say if a person is walking in dark with a torch then the tor the torch the light coming from the torch is coming from that person but then that light is also that the person is also observing 
so consciousness refers to both the light that illumines things and consciousness also refers to the observer who sees what is illuminated hmm. so now the body is here the mind is here this the, the, they call a subtle body is here and the soul is here so the subtle body which involves the mind and the intellect both intelligence both they are coverings on the soul and then beyond that there is the physical body and the physical world so the when the consciousness comes <laughs> from the soul outwards it is filtered and directed by the mind and the intelligence say for example right now uh, we are having this talk but within our minds there might be the thought it's going too long i'm hungry now uh, when will we have food so the the consciousness is coming out but the mind is directing oh, what will be there for food when will i get the food but then the intelligence is there say, this is quite interesting now i want to understand this so the intelligence is driving back to the speech so we <laughs> so we could say that um, say so there is a torch and the torch light is coming but if there is a wind moving the wind may move the torch in this direction torch light in this direction or the torch itself may move like the oscillate and then the light will flicker accordingly so like that when the soul's consciousness comes out the mind and the intelligence they both direct the consciousness in different ways and depending on who is stronger the consciousness will be pulled or directed in that in that particular direction so the mind and intelligence they are not the source of consciousness they are the channel by which consciousness comes out so i use the word that the root and route so the soul is the root of consciousness the mind intelligence they are the route of consciousness and as far as when we use the word krishna consciousness what that means is that there we refer to our consciousness is directed towards krishna <coughs> so we may be doing various things we may doing uh, we may doing our jobs we may doing our family responsibilities but we do it in a mood of service to krishna and especially we cultivate krishna consciousness by doing the activities that direct our consciousness towards krishna so for example when we do japa when we hear the bhagavad gita when we uh, take darshan of krishna these are activities that directly connect our consciousness with krishna so that's how we can become krishna conscious okay thank you so shall we stop here so thank you very much for your attention and participation hare krishna hare krishna <laughs> so we have a few books here should i announce yeah.